Our brother lost his life like a hunted dog. A god brought low and left on the forest floor to rot. Mambo's voice boomed across the gathered snake people, trembling with fury. His fists were clenched, his chest heaving, as the crowd stood silent before him. Kato, one of our own, dragged through the dirt, his blood staining the ground like he was nothing. Mambo's eyes blazed with rage. Is this how it ends? Us gods, hunted as animals? The crowd stirred, anger rising with every word, like embers catching fire. We will burn their lands. We will find their family lineage to the very young amongst them, and we will spill their blood. We will show them that gods do not fall without dragging the world down with them. Mambo's voice cracked with raw emotion as he pointed toward the horizon. When we are done, they will whisper our names in fear, knowing that no one escapes the wrath of a god. The crowd roared in agreement, their anger ignited. The grief that had weighed them down began to twist into something darker, something deadly. They weren't just mourning anymore, they were preparing for war. You are watching the Tales of the Savannah. Subscribe and be part of the tribe. Now let's get back to the story. Across the land, inside a dark cave, the hunters gathered. Cabo the Great stood before them, his expression proud but cautious. We did it, he said, his voice calm but firm. The goddess gave us a chance, and we took it. We ended the life of one of the snake people. But make no mistake, this was not a victory to be proud of. The hunters, still breathless from their victory, leaned in closer to listen. That snake was fast. Too fast. Cabo continued, his voice growing darker. He almost made it back to his people. How many arrows did we shoot at that serpent missing the mark every time? If we aren't sharper, stronger, we won't survive what's coming. Murmurs of agreement spread through the group. They are coming for us. And when they do, they will bring all their fury, Cabo warned. If we are weak, even for a second, the goddess's gift will have been wasted. The hunters nodded in agreement. Cabo raised his fist. We must train harder, faster, because when they strike, we will be ready. We are hunters, and hunters must never back down. The cave filled with a resounding roar of agreement, the sound of it echoing off the stone walls like a promise. Back in the Snake People's camp, the mood had shifted sharply. Suddenly, one of Mambo's scouts burst through the gathering, dragging an old man behind him. The stranger was beaten and bloodied, but his eyes burned with defiance. The scout shoved the old man to the ground at Mambo's feet. We found him picking herbs near the border. He's a healer from the north, the scout said, and he's the one who summoned the hunter goddess. The crowd gasped, rage flickering like wildfire through their ranks. Mambo crouched low, meeting the old man's gaze, his eyes filled with cold fury. Who are you? Mambo hissed. What are those creatures you unleashed on us? The old man chuckled, even as blood dripped from his lips. My name means nothing to you, but I have waited for this day all my life, for it was foretold that my head would fall to a man-turned snake. Mambo's eyes narrowed, his hands twitched, ready to strike, but the old man kept talking. For years the prophecy made no sense, but now I see it clearly. It was foretold that mine will be the last blood you will ever drink for it will turn poison. It will drive you mad until you destroy yourselves. The crowd scoffed. The old man had gone mad saying things that did not make any sense. The old man's smile widened, filled with both pity and triumph. Those hunters are not ordinary men. They are divine vengeance, retribution for all the blood you have spilled. They are the gods' answer to your arrogance, and they will end you. Mambo's expression darkened, but a flicker of unease flashed in his eyes. For a brief moment, the healer's words unsettled him, but only for a moment. If they are divine, Mambo whispered, then let them meet true power. Without warning, Mambo transformed into a massive snake. Before anyone could react or ponder on the words spoken by the old man Mambo struck, his fangs gleamed in the dying light as they sliced through the old man's neck separating his head from his body in an instant. The crowd gasped, frozen in shock, as the prophecy came true right before their eyes. The snake people had heard the warning, but chose to ignore. For it is said, 
the gods always warn before they strike. Such is the way of the gods. Let me tell you a story about the entity called the Guardian of the Forest. The Guardian Spirit was created by the forest god himself. Some called her a witch, whispering her name with fear. But she was far more than the stories told. She was the heart and soul of the forest itself. With her presence, the ancient woods thrived, holding a fragile balance between light and darkness. Without her, the shadows grew bold, creeping through the trees and twisting the forest into a place of nightmares. But as long as the Guardian stood, peace reigned, and both good and evil knew their place. When a Guardian met their end, their spirit drifted through the woods like a restless storm, searching for a new vessel to restore balance. Without the Guardian, the forest would descend into chaos, shadows growing longer, and creatures lurking in the dark becoming bold. To summon a new Guardian, a healer would perform an ancient ceremony, for the forest demanded a soul pure of heart, untouched by greed or malice. A child was often chosen, innocent, unaware of the burden that awaited them. When the guardian spirit took hold, the child ceased to be their own. Their eyes darkened with ancient knowledge, their voice became a whisper on the wind, and their heart beat with the pulse of the forest. They became more than human, a vessel of balance, a watcher, a force beyond mortal understanding. Each guardian, throughout the ages, was bound to protect something sacred, sometimes a tree, sometimes a waterfall, sometimes a single flower. What she chose became the heart of the forest and she would guard it with her life. The magic she carried allowed her to take any shape she wished, a bird in the canopy, a wolf at night, or even a tiger with eyes that glowed like fire. If those who wandered too close feared a witch, she let them believe it. But if fear was not enough, she became something far greater, something that could tear intruders apart. The flower she guarded was unlike any other. It carried the power of both creation and destruction, the raw magic of the forest itself. In the right hands, it could heal the sick, bring back life, and cleanse the darkest souls. But in the wrong hands, it would unleash horrors beyond imagination, spreading ruin like wildfire. Many came searching for the flower, thieves, kings, and desperate souls, but few lived to tell the tale. Some returned broken with stories of a beast with golden eyes that hunted without mercy. Others vanished, swallowed whole by the forest as if it had grown teeth. The Guardian was not a hero, nor was she a villain. She was the balance, the watcher, and the heart of the forest. And so the legend warned, if you dare enter the heart of the forest, tread lightly. You may meet a witch or you may meet the beast, Either way, the Guardian will decide your fate, and if she finds you unworthy, not even the trees will remember your name. The Guardian of the Forest stood tall at the mountain's peak, her eyes fixed on Zorro and Seer as they approached. A sly smile crept across her face. I wonder what I should turn into. Maybe a dragon. I could burn you both to ashes. We mean no disrespect, Guardian. We have a problem that needs solving, and the flower you protect is our only hope. We only wish to take a few and return before our time runs out. We don't want to fight you, Guardian, but if we must, we will. Zoro tightened his grip on his sword, ready for anything. I cannot let you take the flower. The Guardian replied, her voice serious. The entity who sent you will use its power in ways I cannot allow. I know why you are here, hunters, and I understand that if we fight, blood will be spilled on this mountain tonight. Yours or maybe mine. The Guardian paused, contemplating. I will make you an offer. Whatever the mermaids have promised you, I will match it. Sia's eyes widened in shock. How then do we convince Mami Wata to give Tendai back? The Guardian's gaze softened. I can give you something similar, but not the same. Its glow will last, but only for a short time. After midnight, the flower will turn to dust in the hands of whoever holds it. Zoro and Seer exchanged glances. This was better than fighting for their lives, with no guarantee of survival. Okay, Zoro said, relief washing over him. We accept your terms. They thanked the Guardian and rushed down the mountain, knowing time was against them. 
they needed to reach the river quickly. When they arrived, Mami Abeni awaited them. I heard the roar of the lion on the mountain and feared you might not return. I take it the guardian is no more? Sia's heart sank as she looked around. Where is Tendai? Mami Abeni's eyes sparkled with mischief. The queen would like to see you. You can present the flowers to her personally. Fear settled over them as they looked at the moon then at each other. What if the flowers turned to dust before they reached the queen? Their hearts raced as they submerged into the water, knowing they had no choice. They had to rescue Tendai, no matter the cost. As they approached the queen, Tendai stood before her, relief washing over him. He smiled at the sight of Zoro and Sia. Sia rushed to him, embracing him tightly. When we leave here, we must leave like hunters, Sia whispered, a joke between them, meaning they would escape fast without questions. Tendai nodded his head, understanding the command. A family reunion. How charming, Mamiwata said, her voice dripping with irony. Where is my gift? Zoro bowed, presenting her with a pouch containing the flowers. What of the witch? I take it she did not survive? If the queen would allow it, we ask that we leave, Zoro said, bowing again. Mamiwata's brow furrowed. There is the matter of Tendai and binding the snake within. I'm afraid the process cannot be rushed. My queen, Seer interjected, when a man survives a battle, life comes into full perspective. We realize that Tendai does not need to change who he is, but instead live in his truth. Tendai wanted to speak, but his father's painful grip on his shoulder silenced him. The queen smiled thoughtfully. Indeed, that is a noble thought. Thank you for the flower. I am in your debt. The three of them bowed deeply before racing away. But as they fled, an uneasy feeling stirred within the queen. Something was off. With a flick of her wrist, she opened the pouch again, her heart racing with excitement. Many had fallen trying to retrieve this flower, and now it was finally in her hands. But confusion washed over her as the flower's vibrant colors began to fade, turning to ash. She screamed, a sound that echoed through the night, reaching Zorro and Sia as they surfaced from the water. They had escaped, but they had made a very powerful enemy. Carbo and his team huddled in the shadows, their hearts racing. The compound is on high alert, Carbo whispered sharply. We need to wait until it calms down. They watched the compound as hours went by, the early morning light creeping in. Some guards were asleep, while others wandered around, talking quietly. This could be a trap, Samuel said, worry in his voice. Agreed, Cabo replied, his eyes scanning the compound. They had pinpointed the cabin where Amina was held. As they entered, they launched a silent and precise attack on the guards inside. Nala's eyes widened in disbelief. Father? She asked, relieved. She could not believe her eyes. She wanted to apologize for disobeying her father, but there was no time for that now. Quickly, they untied Amina from the shackles binding her. She stumbled forward, supported by Samuel and another hunter. Just as Jengo was about to exit the cabin, a massive figure blocked the doorway, trapping him inside. Well, if it isn't the legend himself, Jengo. I had a feeling you would come here yourself, Lunga said. Jengo was too stunned to speak. Condolences on the sudden death of your brother. I heard he just fell in the street, one minute healthy, and the next gone. Such a shame they don't make hunters like they used to in the old days. Now they are just weak, he mocked. I could say the same to you, Jengo replied. Black Rose had so much life in her. What sucked the life out of her young one day and rapidly aged her the next, Lunga hissed. Jengo had struck a nerve. Jengo was right. Black Rose had sacrificed years off her life so Amina could live a normal life, free from the burden of her gift. But it had come at a huge cost. That, my dear tribe members, is a story for another day. Lunga bared his fangs and backed out of the cabin. His snake form could not fit in the confined space. Jengo unsheathed his sword, ready for a fight. Nala looked back, panic rising in her voice. Where is father? She realized he had been left behind. Samuel grabbed her arm. He's coming. We need to go. Now. The sounds of the snake people grew louder, their hisses echoing in the air. 
Run, Nala. This is what your father wanted. With tears streaming down her face, Nala ran faster than ever before, her heart racing. Back at the compound, Jengo faced a circle of snake people, their eyes filled with anger. I demand a duel, he shouted, voice strong and clear. The snake people stopped, staring at Lunga. I thought you would never ask, Lunga said with a smile, but not against you. Who then? I choose Kwame, Jengo replied, looking directly at Kwame. Jengo stepped closer to Kwame, so close he could see the blood flow in his veins. I want to see you turn into the snake you are. So be it, Queen Amina called out from a distance, her voice steady. You will have your duel at sunset. The crowd murmured with discontent. He should die now, they shouted, frustration rising. But Amina stood firm. Ending Jengo's life was not a decision to make lightly. The duel would buy them time. She needed to summon the snake goddess and let her decide Jengo's fate, knowing that whatever happened next could change everything. And that, my dear tribe members, is the end of yet another episode in our Snake People series. If you're joining us for the first time, make sure to watch these two videos to catch up from the very beginning. Tribe members, do you remember Kitapo or Mermaid Girl and all the fascinating stories in that series? Well, I'm currently compiling that entire storyline into one video so we can all catch up and hopefully continue from there. So keep an eye out for that video coming out this week. I read all your comments and they provide me with valuable insights into your thoughts and help me answer the questions you have. Let me know what your biggest lesson was from this episode. And as always, thank you for watching our story and we hope you enjoyed it. What lessons did you draw from this story? Share your thoughts with us in the comments below. Don't forget to subscribe and be part of the tribe. Thank you for watching The Tales of the Savannah. We will see you next time in the Savannah.